Hello, Sitroom executives. Welcome back to another episode. Today, we have Elliot Indig, a real estate attorney who specializes in understanding legal, business, and strategy issues from the point of the sophisticated real estate professional. He advises business owners and entrepreneurs in a variety of business planning matters, including entity selection, intellectual property protection, and corporate governance. If you're a real estate investor looking for a talented real estate attorney, you should connect with Elliot right away. In this episode, we discuss some of the common business entities real estate investors use, including the advantages and disadvantages, as well as talk about leases and purchase agreements. Now, before we get started, I want to make a disclaimer. Every legal situation has different nuances, and accordingly, general legal advice may not work for one's current situation, so independent legal counsel should be consulted. Elliot Indig, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. It's definitely a pleasure. So why don't we uh, go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit about uh, your background and how what you're doing currently relates to real estate. So uh, I'm uh, an attorney. I practice primarily in the real estate arena. I'd say about 70 to 75% of my practice is on the commercial real estate transaction side. Um, I also do a fair amount of title insurance litigation, and I do some commercial collections as well. So those are the main, the main, uh, main aspects of uh, of my practice. And uh, as to my background, uh, I'm originally from New York, and I moved to Michigan about ten and a half years ago. I went to law school, my first year in New York at uh, Hofstra University School of Law out in Long Island, and I finished in Detroit at uh, Wayne State University Law School. And I've been at my current firm, Aiden Baumschlaf and Bloom, for about uh, going on seven years now. I've been ba- here basically since uh, since I graduated. Made a short stop somewhere else first, but been here basically since then. All right. Now, uh, one question I typically see online. It's uh, usually with a lot of new real estate investors entering the industry, and they always ask about. Uh, entity set up. And I know that's one area that you specialize in. So could we just uh, talk a little bit about some of the most common business entities that you find real estate investors are using? Sure. Um, And they really just boil down to two entities that I've really seen. I haven't seen anything other than a LLC, a limited liability company, or an LP, a limited partnership. Those are really the only two things that I have seen. Now, yes, people do um, use corporations, whether it's an S-corp or a C-corp, um, or certain jurisdictions allow an LLP, I believe, but I'm not sure that may only be a professional thing. So again, I'm not sure. I know that in, in Michigan, that's not really an option. Um, so the two main ones I'm seeing are LLC and LP. And just everyone has to understand the caveat that a lot of what entity selection is based upon are the tax consequences. So consulting with um, your tax advisor or CPA is very important at that juncture. And to give you an example uh, as to why that may matter is that especially if you are dealing with, if you're going to have in your pool of investors, anyone from out of the country, many countries do not recognize an LLC as something separate and distinct like the U.S. does. Because in the, LLC, in the United States, an LLC is something called a flow-through entity, which means that basically the cash comes into that entity and it is not taxed at the entity level. It's only taxed when it trickles down to the member at the end. So let's say there's, there's a property, there's entity A, and then it comes to me. It only gets taxed when it gets to me. As a, The difference is by a corporation, it'll get taxed at the corporate level once, and then again, when it gets to me. Now, in certain countries, they look at an LLC like a corporation. So when you're having an investor from overseas, they're not going to want to go near an LLC because they're going to get taxed twice in their country. So they're going to insist upon having a limited partnership. 
So those are some of the things you have to think about. Um, just again, that's just sort of one situation. Um, and then on um, not the non-tax side, an LLC is typically, if all the formalities are observed, is considered something that is provides more of a uh, corporate shield than an LP does, uh, because an LLC is considered a corporation, separate and distinct. An LP is, is a partnership, and a partnership sometimes are more easily pierced than a uh, than an LLC. Okay, and speaking of you know that aspect there that you just mentioned here towards the end, you know, and here's a question from. Um, one of the members in our Facebook group, he asked, is a limited partner of a multifamily rental property held liable for personal injury um, on an individual in that same property? So could we just kind of address, I guess, the liability aspects between the LLC and the LP in this type of a scenario? So I would say in, in, in a perfect world, all things being equal, all corporate formalities being done correctly, an LLC is typically considered something that is much harder to pierce on the corporate side than an LP. Um, and because that's more like a corporation, an LP is more like a partnership. And again, I also have to mention that it's also very much state specific because every state has different, different laws and different rules with regards to LLCs and LPs. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's, that's, that's number one. And it's also important for the individual who asked that question, everyone else to understand is that irrespective of whether that person can actually be held liable, if that person is someone of, of means that has assets that has deep pockets, many times someone will just rope them into litigation just in the hopes that they'll just give them some nuisance money. Or just to see, hey, you know what, we'll, we'll give it a shot. But bottom line, this is all probably something that would not happen. And that's because typically speaking, an injured party would first go to the insurance company because that's really where the money is. But of course, it's a litigious society and, uh, you know, anything, anything can happen. So I would just say, bottom line is, LLC provides more protection, but if you have adequate insurance, you should be fine either way. Okay. So what are some of the biz biggest mistakes that you see new investors they're making when they're setting up these business entities? So that's some of the biggest mistakes would be not consulting with their tax advisor before setting up the entities. Um, because like I said before, a lot of, a lot of it is tax driven, um, setting up an entity itself, registering the entity is pretty simple. Uh, you know, anyone can basically do it, uh, online these days. Uh, there are companies that do it, third party companies Where, what gets into the tricky part is the underlying documents that contain the rights and responsibilities of the parties that are party to the entity. So for instance, in an LLC would be an operating agreement, LP would be a you know, limited partnership agreement and so on and so forth. The corporation would be a shareholder agreement. The biggest mistakes really usually happen on those levels, meaning someone either not having a, an operating agreement, which leads to many problems. If someone has partners, then it turns into a serious, he said, she said, oh, I thought you meant this, I meant that. And then boom, before you know it, the sparks are flying. Um, and also it, goes to the corporate formality aspect. If you have an LLC and you don't have an operating agreement, um, it can be argued that the LLC is just an extension of the person and that the corporate veil is more easily pierced. So just to sort of sum up, I'd say most mistakes happen on the, on the documentation side, mm -hmm. um, making understanding that before you get the best time to iron out all details of a deal, are in the beginning. You sit down with your partner or partners or whatever, however it is going to be, and it's like anything else. You have a discussion. These are the key business points. Who has the day to day control? How are the distributions made? What happens upon death or disability? Um, who's going to run what aspect of the property? Who's, how, who gets to decide whether you can sell, refinance, etc.? So all these things have to be worked out at the outset, and the more that's worked out at the outset, the less uh, potential for headaches there are later on. Okay. So uh, another question that you know, we, were, we briefly talked about earlier was related to some key you know, must-haves 
when you know these investors are setting up new entities and are there any like key must haves that you you would say because i'm sure that uh, opinions may vary among people, but just based on your experience, what would you say are some must-haves? So, on the operating agreement, you talk, you're talking about more on the on the agreement side, the operating agreement or limited partnership yes. agreement side. Yes. So, most agreements will have their, their standard boilerplate stuff that you can sign in counterparts that it's uh, subject to the the jurisdiction of the state at issue. Um, you know, for the most part, you're going to have you should have all the standard boilerplate stuff in there. Most agreements are going to have that. Um, so that stuff is typically going to be taken care of. And typically, because again, if you have a decent starting point, all the main, all that kind of, all that stuff is going to be there. But I'm going to go back to my previous point on that. The must haves in the agreement at the end of the day is the agreement between the various members or partners or shareholders of that company, because everything begins and ends with that. If there's some kind of other defect in the operating agreement, okay, mm -hmm. you and I have a company, right? We get along very, very well. So if there's another issue in the operating agreement, okay, we'll fix it, right? We'll, we'll unanimously fix it. It's all good. But if you and I are adverse, then that's when there's an issue. So everything needs to be worked out in the beginning. And because so like, and again, like so anything like uh, uh, in, the, in the agreement that's, that's technically off, that can be fixed later on. It's not. It's usually not the end of the day. But what is much harder to fix later on are business terms. Um, who gets to do what? Because when those issues are reexamined, it's either because the property is being sold or financed, which is fine, or there's some kind of conflict. And by that time, it's often too late. Okay. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, uh, you know, we had in, in speaking of these agreements, I, I had asked you another question earlier. We meant I mentioned uh, rock solid uh, purchase agreement. You know, what would that look like? And uh, you know, your your response. I'll just let you say it. You know, it was it was great. So uh, let's talk about that. A rock solid purchase agreement. Yeah, like, like I mentioned before, there there's there's no such thing. It's a misconception. Um, a, a contract that's totally airtight probably does not exist um, because life has a way of throwing things at people that they've, that they've never seen. People may have a contract they think is really, really good and addresses a lot, a lot of different things. Um, and yes, you can probably make some kind of a contract that's just as simply party X is responsible for anything and everything that ever happens from now until eternity. Okay, that's pretty, but again, no one's signing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm talking about a regular, classic, typical agreement. There's always things that can happen. The longer you're in the business, whether you're on the legal side or on the investing side, you see crazy things happen that sort of fall in between the cracks. They don't really fit into one clause, one sentence, one section of the contract somewhere in between or somewhere outside. Then what do you do? Okay, that's another story, you know, that's that's after the fact. But it's important to know that yes, you have to do your best at the outset. You have to really try to drill down, get the best contract you can, try to address all the concerns as much as you can, but you can never go into anything saying anything in life, I think, saying that it is a slam dunk 100%. There's nothing ever going to happen. Things just don't work that way unfortunately. Okay. <clears throat> and with regards to uh, the leasing agreements, you know, we had talked about earlier as well. I thought you brought up a really good and relevant point uh, when I asked you about the terminology here, um, because I've seen in, you know, the agreement titled, you know, lease agreement, and I've also seen it where it's titled, you know, rent agreement. So what is the difference? So without knowing whether there are certain specifications or cer certain requirements in different jurisdictions about how to term that agreement. And I'll get into that a little, a little bit later with some examples. This really gets to defined terms. Um, and, and it's very important because let me just explain what defined terms are, and then I'll sort of get into why, why it is important is that the defined term is like you see very often in, in an agreement, um, let's say the word, and I'll pick this because I'll go into an example and a reason, the word effective date, okay? And then you say the contract is uh, executed as of January 1st, 2020, and then you'll have in 
parentheses and then in quotation marks, effective date, capital letters, effective, capital letters, date, right? Whatever, the first letter of each one. So then that means that for the remainder of the document, whenever it says effective date, it means January 1st. Um, and the same thing with lease agreement, rental agreement, right? I, I can call it, um, again, well, no one would do this, but I, I can call it pizza eating agreement. But as long as I, if I define pizza eating as the term that someone can stay in a property, that's, that's what it means. It's weird, but I can really define it however I want. So unless the agreement says something totally different that it can be interpreted totally differently, I think it's the same thing. And let me just go to a quick, a quick story about effective date is that I, right now we were dealing with a situation where there was a contract, a purchase agreement where the effective date was not defined. So the deposit, so the due diligence period had ended, but no one, but it was not defined when the effective date of the contract was. So now the date, now the parties are fighting over the deposit because one party saying, well, everyone knew the effective date was this date. They, I signed it on the 16th. You signed it on the 17th. The title company acknowledged it here and there and this and that. That's all well and good. But if the effective date would have been defined in the agreement, there's no controversy. Mm -hmm. So just something to keep in mind how, how this can play in real life. So in a situation, and just out of curiosity, in a situation like that, I mean, you know, in the eyes, I guess in the eyes of the court, you know, what would, what would the court see, you know, in, in the eyes of the court? The court, again, so one caveat about courts mm -hmm. is that it's, an, it's, it's another one of the big unknowns. So you can typically say what you would hope the court would do, mm -hmm. but the longer you're around, you know, you get, you get surprised all the time. <laughs> I, I, the, the court will the court will typically look at the document and try to ascertain the intent of the parties from the document what what they thought it was and i don't know offhand if there's case law as to this but typically speaking when the second party signs the agreement that is typically when the contract becomes binding and that is typically considered the effective date so do I think that the court will view that as the effective date? I think the court should. Will the court? That's another matter entirely. Okay, got it. <clears throat> so, I mean, you've been practicing law for quite some time now. So, you know, what's some of the stickiest situations that you've seen as an attorney handling real estate transactions? So, this one was actually... Uh, a doozy and let me just give a little bit of, a little bit of background um so i, I started yeah you know i started basically basically fresh out of law school and you know my my office was very very kind they said hey you know you can come over here and you know see what you can make of yourself we'll give you an office a bunch of great attorneys here great real estate attorneys willing to help you everything else but uh you know it's basically you're going to go on sort of an entrepreneurial type of basis, eat what you kill and, you know, go from there. So I said, okay, listen, you know, the, the market is down now. Um, but this is what I want to do. Real estate interests me. So I start working and slowly, but surely I pick up a client here, I pick up a client there. And most of my clients are also they're They're, they're just starting out in what they're doing. They're buying single family homes. Um, they're renting them out. So I'm doing the purchases i'm even doing the evictions i'm doing all sorts of things and then slowly but surely over the years my you know certain of my clients decided to move on from the single family homes and they move into one this particular client that i'm going to talk about right now bought a small um multi-family had about 20 25 unit multi-family you know under like i don't know six six hundred thousand dollar properties give or take and okay great very very good one day he gives me a call, this fellow, and all right, we're going to try and purchase a $20 million property. So for me, this was like territory that I have had not been in yet. So, so much so that, uh, you know, that when we had a lender's kickoff call scheduled, this was the first lender's kickoff call that I ever had or ever heard of. So I was, I was panicking. I didn't know what they're going to want, what they're going to ask me. I was asking one of my colleagues to get on with like that. That's mm -hmm. how far it was. Like I, I really, this was like, so this was like all new territory for me, but you know, again, I've, you know, at the end of the day, the guys, the folks in my firm helped me out, but just to give you a little bit of a sense, so this is my first big deal. 
So things are going wrong along with the securitized transaction, a lot of loan documents and opinions and entity formation and this and that and the other thing. And we're finally getting to the finish line. And it's a, it's a, it's a large property. I would say about 400 units. And closing is scheduled for, I don't know, a few days away. The lender's attorney reaches out to me and says, all right, we just got the PZR back from the city, the, the zoning report. And it looks like there's a few open – um, open things in the property, violations or open permits or this or that. I was like, well, what do you mean? What's going on? So they said, yeah, we didn't get all the information. We have to delay closing for now. Said, okay. You know, of course I'm panicking, you know, I don't know what's going on, this and that. So turns out that many years ago, I don't remember exactly how many years ago it was 15, 20 years ago, the owners of this building contemplated going condo doing a condo conversion on the building. In connection with that, they pulled permits. They had to pull permits on all of the units in the building, all the apartments, because in order to qualify for a condo conversion, they, they needed inspections, they needed certain upgrades, whatever it was that they needed. In the middle of the process, the owners of the property decided, you know what, we're going to keep it as a rental property. We're not going to go condo. But all of these units had open permits. So you had a 400 unit building of which 100, 150 units had open permits, which was something that the lend was objectionable to lender in order to close. So we had to go into scramble mode. And mind you, I was getting, I was, I was getting calls from, you know, my client was, my client was actually pretty calm about this, but his investors were calling me like, what's going on here? Why the delay? And I'm trying to explain it to them. And it, it was a little bit of a mess. But long story short, um, we got in contact with the city and we were able to get the situation expedited. And we got the people out there to inspect um, and take a look at all the units and do what they had to do. But it was a delay of a month. It took a month wow. to do that. Yeah, but on the flip side, we were able to negotiate a pretty significant, you know, a six-figure discount from the seller due to the situation. So, you know, it was, uh, you know, bad on one side, but it was a learning experience. And the learning experience, I think, for me and for, I guess, for, for anyone else, really, whatever you're doing, that certain things, uh, especially when, when they're new and they're out of left field and they're unexpected and at the last moment, they, you know, it looks like the uh, – world's crashing down, but uh, you have to take a deep breath. And it's easier said than done when you're not in the situation. Step back, reassess, plan, and uh, you know, hopefully come to, come to some kind of a resolution. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really personally familiar with uh, the whole condo conversion process. So with these open permits and everything, basically you're saying to get them closed out, like the owner would like if I am a building owner and I was and I was in this same situation, um, I would need to actually close those out myself. I'd have to contact the city. They'd have to come out and do inspections. And I have to close out the permits myself before I sell, right? Correct. Right. You would have mm -hmm. to do it yourself. You'd have to make sure that it's done yourself, or you can just tell the purchaser, "Hey, this is what's going on." Um, you know, I'm willing to. The property is a ten million dollar property, but I don't want to deal with this. You know, I'll give you a discount of X in the beginning, but just just the, you will acknowledge in the purchase agreement that you're aware of these open permits and you're willing to buy the property anyway. And this is uh, not the, the, the purchase of the property is not contingent on this. Mm -hmm. And so you have to move forward either way. So, you know, again, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a contract is negotiable like anything else. But again, in, in Michigan and again, and I'm not uh, a big expert on the condo side either, but what essentially have what essentially needs to be done is yes like you said these need to be closed out the city needs to come and inspect and of course invariably when the city inspects you know which again i didn't really get into when i spoke about the the story they're going to always find other stuff <laughs> so it's sort of a it's a never it's like a chain reaction it's sort of a never-ending uh never-ending thing you know they come to inspect and you got to do this you got to do that and you know it turns into a you know the whole uh a whole long story. So, yeah. but hey, you know, we survived. You, you guys made it through. Yeah. So, uh, so what would be a suggestion? Suggest, uh, geez, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm fumbling here. What would be a suggestion? There we go. 
what suggestion would you have for uh, new investors, you know, people that are, you know, looking at, uh, you know, getting started in the industry? Surround yourself with good people. Um, and and I'm, not, I'm not talking about professionals. I'm, you know, obviously professionals are important also, but there's just so many people out there who are willing to help, A, because they're good people, but B, because 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, that was them. Mm-hmm. So there are people ready, willing, and able to help and reach out to people. Um, you'd be surprised. You, you, people are want to see other people succeed for the most part, and that, that that's key. And there's people that are going to help you, the people that, that are willing to help that you can learn from, um, and that's, that's step one. You know, Surround yourself with good people, learn from them, and of course you have to have a good a good team of of professionals, of people advising you on the tax side, on the legal side, and, you know, on the finance, on the finance side, lending side, banking side. So yeah, those are all, those are all key. Okay. And is there any uh, reading material, like maybe books or something you would suggest for people to take a look at? Uh, Real estate related. um, Or personal development or anything. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there is the, uh, what's it called? The, there is a clear couple of books that I've read. That um, one is uh, called Indistractable mm-hmm. by Nir Eyal. Um, it basically talks about how to sort of push away everything that distracts you, so you can focus uh, very, very well. Because, as I'm sure you're aware, like you know, we, we've been sitting talking here, right? Our phones have been, you know, emails and WhatsApps and texts and everything else. So that's a very distracting thing when you're trying to get things done. I mean, research has shown that uninterrupted uh, concentration gets the best results. But in this day and age, it's it's very, very hard, especially in a a service business like like I'm in. You know, the clients need everything yesterday. So (laughs) you have to understand when you you can answer the phone. And it's it's a discipline. It's very, very hard. It's a struggle. So that's that's a book that I found uh, that I found pretty, pretty eye-opening. Okay. So how could our listeners uh, get in touch with you if, you know, they wanted to uh, reach out? So they can, uh, I can be emailed at uh, eindig at aidenbaum.com. That's E-I-N-D-I-G at aidenbaum, A-I-D-E-N-B-A-U-M.com. Or I can be called at my office at uh, 248 865 or you can hit me up on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. Now, before I let you all go, one final note Elliot and I discussed but was afraid we didn't mention it is regarding liability in a limited partnership. In a limited partnership, the general partner, not the limited partners, is the one that is subject to liability, whereas in an LLC, the manager has essentially the same protections as the other members. That is why, very often, A general partner is an LLC because it adds an extra layer of protection. Now remember, every legal situation is different, so make sure you consult with legal counsel. Thanks for joining us.